good evening, everyone. I'm Mark Albert, and I'd like to welcome to the October ASJ Journal Club presented by the Young Aesthetic Plastic Surgeons Committee. The article we'll be discussing tonight is rhinoplasty in the older adult. And a couple of reminders. Number one, please mute your microphones at all times. If you have a question, please enter it in the chat box or raise your hand. And as Dr. Naff suggested, turning on your video camera would be wonderful. Um, tonight, I'm joined by YAPS committee member, Dr. Denise Sarhadi. She's going to be presenting poll questions periodically through the night, and she's also going to relay your questions from the chat box at the end. So I'd like to begin by introducing the author and our two discussants tonight, though none of the three of them need any introduction, that is for sure. Um, and after we introduce, we'll get into our discussion. So to start, we have the honor of having Dr. Derek Steinbacher, the author of this month's article. Dr. Steinbacher practices in Connecticut. If you can mute your microphone, really appreciate it. Um, Dr. Steinbacher practices in yeah. Connecticut as a professor of plastic surgery and chief of craniofacial and maxillofacial surgery at Yale. He attended Harvard Medical School, school trained at Mass General Hospital, Johns Hopkins, and Penn. His clinical focus includes rhinoplasty, orthognathic, and facial skeletal aesthetic surgery. His research includes a large clinical series of three uh, rhinoplasty and orthognathic outcomes, tissue engineering, artificial intelligence, and other aspects of plastic surgery. So thank you, Dr. Steinbach, for being here. Our first discussant of the night is Dr. Sherelle Aston. Dr. Aston is a New York City double board, for, board certified plastic surgeon who's one of the world's foremost experts in aesthetic plastic surgeon. Dr. Aston is a professor of plastic surgery at NYU. He's past president of the American Society for Aesthetic Plastic Surgery. He's a fellow of the American College of Surgeons, and he was chairman of the plastic surgery department at Manhattan Eye, Ear, and Throat Hospital for 23 years. Dr. Aston has dedicated his life to education. He's authored countless scientific papers, textbooks, teaching videos, all for plastic surgery. He's regularly invited to lecture and operate in numerous countries, and he's recently been preparing for the upcoming Cutting Edge Global Symposium, which is live streamed from Bogota, Colombia. It's temporarily postponed this year due to COVID, but he's hoping to have it running this spring at the earliest. So thank you so much, Dr. Aston, for being with us. And our second discussion of the night is Dr. Paul Nassif. Dr. Nassif is a world-renowned Beverly Hills facial plastic and reconstructive surgeon, and he's star of E's show Botched. He's affiliated with UCLA, LA County Hospital, and USC. He's authored over 50 peer-reviewed articles on aesthetic surgery, and he's lectured over 175 times. Dr. Nassif is also director of a fellowship training program accredited by the American Academy of Facial Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. Pardon me, Dr. Nassif remains dedicated to helping others in need and is very involved with Face to Face, which is an organization that offers surgery to domestic violence victims. And he's also very involved with St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital. So Dr. Nassif, thank you so much for being here. So let's get started at this point. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Steinbacher. He'll share his screen with us and discuss his article. Thank you. Great, thanks. Thanks so much, Mark. Can everybody see the, the full screen here? It looks great, we can see it, thank you. Perfect. Well, these are, these are my disclosures um, for this book, some instruments and um, some research uh, grants that we have. So the paper that we're discussing tonight, uh, you know, this was really helped and spearheaded by our, our great research team, including uh, Suman, who's now at UCLA. Um, but what we wanted to look at is rhinoplasty in the older adult. Uh, and the three areas that we set out to focus on are number one, look at aging nose and rhinoplasty literature using some of the Strobe guidelines since 1970. Number two, review our own cohort over about a year, a year and a half period with at least 16 months of follow up particularly looking at some of the patient characteristics and indications for undergoing rhinoplasty, looking at their dysmorphology and some of the techniques that we would use in a targeted way. And then lastly, look at anthropometric data. We do a lot of 3D imagery and we wanted to look at before and after results uh, in their morphometric data. <clears throat> so when we initially set out, you know, we hypothesized 
that there will be some common findings or patterns of the nose uh, that are seen or experienced with age. Number two, that some of the indications um, in this age group, maybe it's not gonna be 100% aesthetic because hopefully in, in our mind or practice anyway, if somebody has a nose that they wanna have aesthetically or cosmetically altered, they would do that earlier in their life so they could have the rest of their life to experience it. So in their teens or 20s or 30s or 40s seems to be the most common time that, uh, that we're doing aesthetic rhinoplasty. Rhinoplasty itself too is not typically a facial aging procedure unto itself. Sometimes it's a, a nice add-on with other procedures. Um, the next indication or thing we expected was that there would be a precipitating event, something like trauma, aging itself, or a prior rhinoplasty that would make them seek this rhinoplasty at this age, uh, later age of life. And then lastly, what are the techniques that, that we use to address some of the issues? So for the first part, you know, we looked since 1970 through the literature um, using strobe guidelines. We went from there was only 87 in the English language anyway, and they were coned down to about nine using the strobe guidelines. Majority of these were really all level five evidence, and six of them basically just described aspects of the aging nose alone. There was only three from this entire 40-year period that really had a series um, with outcomes and what the indications were, um, uh, but none of them really discussed the maneuvers used and nothing really had 3D outcomes. And these are the three really within the last 10 or 15 years uh, or 20 years, but nothing really earlier looking at this population. So next we move to look at our cohort over about a year and a half period. 27 patients, uh, the majority were female, um, slightly more than half were in the younger of the older age groups, so from 55 to 65, and about 40% were over 65. The majority were Caucasian, and about a quarter had a prior rhinoplasty. This was a revision rhinoplasty. They weren't as healthy as uh, some of the younger age groups and had comorbidities such as hypertension, hyperlipidemia. About 11% were on anticoagulation. Um, and the ASA status for an anesthesia perspective was 96% uh, was ASA 2 or 3 in distinction to younger patients, uh, many of which are ASA 1. The techniques that uh, we used in these patients, osteotomies in about 60% of the time, which is a little less than, than our usual cosmetic rhinoplasty, septoplasty 96% of the time, dorsal reduction 37% of the time, whereas augmentation was more about 81% of the time, spreader grafts or flaps in 100%, septal extension graft, 67%, uh, ALAR grafting in about 70%, tip grafts in about 70%, and about 85% had some turbinate uh, procedures as well. Looking at sort of the problem or the morphology, um, the solutions that we usually would use for the tip uh, position and droop, septal extension graft and tip graft, reduction in augmentative type uh, techniques as standard, uh, septoplasty, spreader grafts, uh, ALAR rim grafting, particularly articulated ALAR rim grafts and doing things to address the airflow dynamics. <clears throat> so here's one of the uh, example patients, she was 65. She had a trauma that unmasked some of her functional and aesthetic concerns. Um, she's in her late 60s. Here's another patient, 73, that she had a prior rhinoplasty as well as a new trauma, had this saddle nose deformity and uh, underwent uh, revision rhinoplasty. My preference is using the septal extension graph that we've written about before because I think it's more robust and gives really powerful uh, control of the tip position um, in terms of both projection and rotation. This is a video in a much younger patient, obviously, but um, we use this graft in many of these um, elderly or older patients just because I think it can control the tip. Here's a patient that underwent some aesthetic uh, augmentation as well. Um, alteration as well with rhinoplasty. And then looking at the anthropometric outcomes, we found that in our cohort, the nasal length decreased mostly because we're rotating the tip. Tip projection increased, columnar length increased, nasolabial angle uh, increased as we turned up the tip. 
And just to finish with a, another example, so here's a patient that had a prior septoplasty, has a, a new trauma that unmasked both functional and aesthetic issues. And this is after using a septal extension graft to elevate uh, the tip, rotate the tip slightly, addresses saddle nose deformity of septal deviation. So in conclusion, uh, you know, our literature review, which is interesting, showed that since 1970, there's really been only three cohort series uh, looking at this population. I think this series that we've published on adds to the literature, particularly to confirm some of the common aging pattern of the nose. Uh, looking at the patient indications, they're both functional and aesthetic concerns. Many of them had a precipitating event, such as trauma or aging in and of itself. Uh, unmasks or brings about new functional or aesthetic concerns. Sometimes this is an add-on for other facial aging procedures, but rhinoplasty alone is not typically an aging face procedure. About a quarter had a revision rhinoplasty. The patients in general are not as healthy. Um, there's a, a greater percentage on anticoagulation, medication, and their ASA status is not as good. And I think we use targeted techniques uh, uh, to get good outcomes uh, to address each of these problems. And the anthropometric and photogrammatic uh, 3D data improves as a result. Thanks for uh, the opportunity to present this paper and I'm looking forward to some of the discussion uh, upcoming now. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Steinbach, I really appreciate it. So next we'll, we'll start with Dr. Aston for his comments. Well, first of all, you'd have to uh, congratulate Dr. Steinbacher on, on his work. I think he's uh, three-dimensional photography and his anthropometric measurements and that sort of stuff set us a standard for evaluating our rhinoplasty results. And, um, and uh, probably not all of us will go to the, uh, that extent, but I certainly congratulate him on doing that. And, and I think that, we, you know, we could, talk about the individual procedures, et, et cetera. But I think everybody on this uh, 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 Zoom tonight knows ab about these particular procedures. And so I think what we wanna do is, is just look at a little bit of, of, of variation just to start some uh, discussion. And I, I think that uh, Dr. Steinbacher, in, there were seven of your patients who had previously undergone a rhinoplasty. And other than, than uh, rhinoplasty not done, given a result to the patient's satisfaction, are there any particular changes within the, uh, the anatomy, the skin, the, the tip, other than where things had been done wrong, as I said, that you noticed? Because you know, years ago, and not that long ago, uh, rhinoplasty was a reduction procedure. And for the last um, oh, three decades, we've been trying to make it not just a reduction procedure, but maintaining architectural support of the nose, because we've all seen those noses that were overdone. And there's no question but what the aging process, as you had pointed out in your paper, produces a, a lot of changes but the patients that, that we, we uh, see who have really very unattractive uh, operated noses didn't look that way when they were a year, two years after surgery for the most part. And, uh, and I've had the ability to, to follow uh, a lot of my noses along because I've got a lot of families that have done many families with two generations, but a bunch of families that I've got three generations of noses on. So, uh, you know, I've, I've had a chance to see how the nose uh, uh, changes with the passage of time. Sometimes happily surprised and sometimes saying, hmm, wish I had done it a little bit differently. So it, it, it speak about the ones who'd already had surgery and, and was anything that sort of rung a bell for you with those? Yeah, I think, you know, interestingly, many of them um, did ha have a prior rhinoplasty, or a quarter of them did anyway, and then there was something new that happened that then all of a sudden 
um, it's pushing them to get a, a revision. And I think in a few of them, it was trauma on top of maybe a, a poorly supported over reduct, you know, uh, reduced nose as that one example I showed where there was a significant saddle nose and then she had a trauma on top of it. Others of them, I think maybe having a lot of the cartilage and structure uh, removed uh, already will weaken some of the support and uh, lead to, you know, uh, more internal and external valve uh, collapse that maybe it's not as noticeable when they're younger, but as they're getting older with, uh, you know, some of the aging changes and uh, skin being more flaccid and less cartilaginous support, then it may be pushing them over the edge where now they're having functional issues as well. So the cartilage was removed, you know, back 20, 30 years ago. Uh, but in their younger years, you know, they were able to tolerate it pretty well, but because of the natural aging process, the turning down of the tip and lock, uh, lack of support, um, you know, that probably pushed them over the edge for functional issues too. So yeah, I think that's true. And, um, and those precipitating events on top of the, the way that rhinoplasties were done 20, 30 years ago, I think is the impetus for seeking it at this point. It, you're, you're absolutely on and target, I agree with you. Now, you, you noted in your paper that you use a lot of, of tip grafts and that none of the uh, grafts were, were visible. And a lot of these noses as they're aged and the skin of the tip gets uh, thinner. And, you know, over the years I've seen, you know, noses that you, you sort of look, you're almost looking through the skin at the, the ala cartilages or what, just left of the ala cartilage many times. Are you crushing your tip grafts? Or what are you doing technically to help hide those? Are you wrapping them in fascia? Or how, how do you uh, help make those not be visible? Yeah, usually I, I won't use any septal cartilage for those grafts. I'll just use uh, lateral cruce from part of the cephalic trim if a cephalic trim is being done, and then usually gently crush it, keep it more in the infralobule as opposed to a true cap or shield or something on top of the domes, but more of an infra, infralobular graft. Um, and, you know, even in that case, as, as you say, with the skin being so thin in many of these patients, they may still become visible with time. Um, you know, many of these patients are 12 or 16 months post-op, but uh, when we reviewed them, but potentially with additional years, you know, they could be visible or, or palpable, but we try to minimize that by crushing using not septal cartilage, but use lateral cruce. And, uh, you know, in some cases we'll do some fat and fat uh, grafting as well. I, I agree with that. It, it, uh, I think a lot of times people do the uh, cephalic margin of the lateral cruise resection and, and it goes on the back table, but it's, it's a great graph material if you need to put something in the tip, uh, just as you uh, indicated. And now you, you mentioned in your paper that you uh, use ri uh, rib when necessary, and I certainly think that's an excellent choice. Uh, do you have some inexperience with uh, preserved cartilage, such as, you know, the, the MTF pre uh, pre preserved cartilage that uh, has become very popular and hard to get ordered at this point in time? Yeah, yeah. So uh, definitely that's part of the discussion in these patients, and I'm sure uh, all of the rhinoplasty pa uh, surgeons participating uh, agree that, you know, once you're over about age 45, using your own uh, rib or over age 50, you know, is not really doable or usable anyway, given the amount of uh, calcification. So in, in this age population, if rib is needed uh, for one of these significant saddle noses or additional support, then it has to be some type of life cell or uh, MTF, uh, you know, frozen cartilage. And um, so, yeah, we, we've used that in, in this population. And um, I think there's good literature and data about that. Yeah. And I found it uh, uh, very useful. And I just one last comment. I, I think your your management of the, of the turbinate with uh, cauterization uh, is is an excellent way uh, to do it. I think that the the old turbinectomy is uh, rarely necessary. It's, you may need some mucosal resection, but I think the cauterization of the turbinate and out fracture really opens the airway and a reasonable number of noses. 
So thank you so much, Dr. Assen. Should we, should we turn it over to Dr. Nassif for some questions or some comments rather? First of all, thanks for having me. It's uh, great to be on this channel club and to uh, electronically and uh, meet all of you. Um, Derek, I think you did a great paper. You know, it's interesting. Uh, you know, obviously to me that when I hear about the patient population, it's a little bit skewed, as you mentioned, of course, more for, uh, even though that review was more post-traumatic, but here we have nasal obstruction. And my patient population is completely different uh, in regards to most of them are still going to come in, number one, and I assume I, maybe Sherelle will have the same because it's east, east and west coast, even though you guys aren't that far, but you know, obviously it's more cosmetic for us still. They always come in saying there's nasal obstruction issues, but when it comes to cosmesis, they're still going at it. And a lot of my patients, a lot of my revisions. But Derek, you know, interesting, when you looked at those old articles, and, and I know I looked at the articles reviewed, um, plastics, otolaryngology, and I saw, you know, really a lot of these patients, again, were the post-traumatic uh, coming in at that older, you know, past 55. Um, and with yours, obviously it was different. It was more nasal obstruction. You have the 27 patients, and I know that you gave data for the four of them. Um, but what would be interesting to basically get a survey, take this paper and get a survey to more rhinoplasty surgeons and to see if the etiology and reasons and some of the other techniques that they do, how much it alters from Yale. It'd be very interesting to see that compared to different parts of the country to see how it skews. So that's just one thought, but um, you know, your, your review of what you did, uh, especially with the aging nose. And to me, the number one thing that I see for aging nose, but again, for me, my greater than 55 year old population, I'm gonna say about 75% of them are revision for me. So obviously I'm using costal cartilage and mentioning real quick about MTF. Uh, I can't get any at all, Sherelle. I, I tried getting, uh, you know, bank cartilage. It's just not available at all. So what I'm doing now is, and Derek, I don't know if you do the same, but if I know if I have, you have to use costal cartilage, either someone with a lot of trauma or over the age of maybe 55, 60, I'm getting a CT scan of the chest to evaluate calcification. And, um, but on yours, for your septal extension graph, which I do that again in most of my cases now for ptosis too, but are a lot of the patients, especially if you're using rib, these older patients, especially if it's calcified, or just it's still a usable rib, but it's calcified. Are they complaining about uh, firmness of the tip too much so? Yeah, you know, I think that's a problem with septal extension graft in general. But um, you know, even the younger patients, I feel like compare uh, complain about some of the stiff aspects. Um, but as many you know have described, I try to bring the domes up over the tip of the septal extension graft, which maybe adds a little bit of flexibility and a little softness. But you know, I think we're kind of weighing, putting the tip where it needs to go, and in opening up the airway and uh, having that reproducible result with a little bit of firmness. So you know, we try to counsel patients about this, but definitely there's some some firmness. I completely agree with you. Um... One thing, especially from the nasal obstruction aspect, if I had to pick an area of maybe what could have been done, or if you end up doing another one where you're having a survey of different doctors, is to try to get a, uh, you know, the nose survey. For all of you who may not know what that is, it's more of evaluating nasal obstruction and septal evaluation. It's called NOSE, obviously. And so that's something that's good to ask. For example, to let you guys know. And that would help really when you're putting a paper like this about nasal obstruction and it really you know goes through uh, not a problem all the way to severe problem nasal congestion or stuffiness nasal blockage or obstruction trouble breathing through the nose trouble sleeping and unable to get enough air through my nose during exercise or ex exertion that's probably the only one thing that maybe would have been just a little bit stronger and the other question is now you have four you have four uh, you reported 
uh, data on four patients. And is that just specific to the paper? Because you did have a long 21 month follow up. Why did you pick those four patients, or is there anything specific about those? Uh, I think we showed four examples, but all of the data where we're looking at percentage of, you know, uh, comorbidities and proceed, we, we included them all in, in the data. And then the re last question for me is the revisions. You had three revisions, correct? Out of the 27? Uh, it, I think it was a little more than that. It was uh, like seven, uh, or, or do you mean revisions that after we read, yes. after we, we did Your own case. revisions, yes. Yeah, 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 that's, that's about right, yeah. What, for, if you could recall, you may not, doesn't matter, but um, what was the reason you think that they needed one of revisions? Yeah, I think they were mostly very small, minimal revisions, such as, um, you know, trimming sometimes with a sepal extension graft, I see a little bit of fullness on one side or the other. So, you know, maybe, uh, especially if you place it not end on, but side to side with the caudal septum, uh, you know, most likely it's something like trimming that or, um, you know, just uh, a turbinate, uh, you know, redoing part of the turbinate for breathing issues or something like that. Um, but it wasn't full redo revisions. It was more kind of- the small things. Yeah, fine, fine tuning. Just to follow up on a question or a, a thought um, from what Dr. Uh, Aston was mentioning about, you know, with these patients with really thin skin, their, th their skin envelope, uh, you know, even though it's kind of, shall we say the good news is it's stretched because most of these times the nose is totic. And um, but tip grafts in this thin uh, thin skin, and I you know you were mentioning uh, uh, Dr. Aston was mentioning you know what you can do, and I noticed that on yours, you had no problem. You were using, if I'm not mistaken, I I understand you were saying some infra tip grafts, but did you say that you're actually putting shield grafts in some of these patients? No, most of them are infralobule, so just uh, below, yeah, below the domes, um, you know, more on the chymella infralobular position. And what are you, are you just, I missed that point in case you said, are you bruising the cartilage or what are you doing? Yeah, we, we crush it and we use only lateral cruise, no septum, no rib in that position. I use lateral, lateral cruise assuming you have it. Yeah. Okay. So one thing that I've been doing now that I switched over, I've been using, you know, I call them combined dome infratibulabular grafts wherever I'm trying to get that projection. And again, depending on what I'm doing for rotation of the tip. And um, uh, two points to that for rotation. And obviously if you look at maxillary alve uh, alveolar hypoplasia or just a totic tip, whatever it's due to, um, What's happening in my population, because just like you, I use septal extension grafts for this probably 75% of the time. Over the last four months, it's interesting, it just started happening more and more. It was almost like a flood. The patients are now coming in to me and saying, you know, my nose is too hard. A lot of it's costal cartilage though. It's too firm. Um, when I kiss my, uh, you know, uh, significant other, it, I can't stand it. I can't stand this rock you put in my nose. And again, you know, one thing about me, I say it as it is. And so, and when I lecture, I talk about all my negative outcomes and this is one of them. And uh, so that's one thing you have to be really careful about is when you put a septal extension graft, unless you have someone again, who needs counter rotation and you have a you know a short over constricted nose that's rotated too much and then you're trying to lengthen the nose. So one thing that I started doing a little bit different, and this is again, especially if I have enough cartilage, um, is stop using septal extension grafts. And this is if I'm trying to rotate and control my projection. Um, I've been actually cutting the medial cura, right in between the medial cura and intermediate cura, cutting it, fixating both of them separately to the septum, um, I stopped doing basic regular tongue and grooves with this to straight back to the septum because I noticed a complete relapse after about a year. And now when you do that, the tip is over rotated near about 115, 120 degrees. And then with that, and I've done maybe about, I don't know, 50 or 60 of these in the last uh, five, six months. I've been using a lot of dice cartilage blue graphs, you know, popularized by Tasman. 
out of Turkey, fibrin glue with diced cartilage. And I've been using that to mold over the columella and the infra tip and the dome, which is softer. And so every one of those patients, at least say the nose is a lot softer. Uh, have any of you, Sherelle or Derek, have any of you been using any uh, diced cartilage glue grafts at all? Well, I have used diced uh, dice cartilage over the years. I've seen way uh, to the point you're, you're making about septal extension grafts. I've seen several patients who uh, um, that I didn't do, but were asking me why the, the tip of their nose was so hard and a bit uh, immobile. But I think that the, the results in the hands of someone like you, someone like uh, uh, Dr. Steinbacher, you know, has a lot of experience with doing this. They can, they can make it work. I'm, I'm partial to uh, Cayumela struts. So obviously, you, you got to do different things for, for different patients. And the other thing is that I'm doing all of these closed. And I think I think both of you are doing them open, right? You're doing all open, Paul. Well, if I have that patient who comes in who can do something for me, remember I was trained open, but I'll do maybe about seven or eight percent of my my cases closed. I mean, I would to do what you do since I've watched you and I've seen your lectures in the past. You understand it? You know, you and Mark Costanchin. I mean, you guys have to have that talent. That to me is one of the hardest things to do to get your results doing it closed. So I'm going to say most of mine are open because I can't achieve what you can do. Well, you could, you could. <laughs> yes, yes, you could. Then I'll have to come out to New York again and be able to have some uh, good food and watch you operate again, like the old days. <laughs> You're always welcome. But I think I think we should see what the uh, questions the audience have for. Dr. Steinbacher and let's do it. Denise, take it away for it. Well, thank you all for being here and especially to everyone who logged on and participated in the polls. Um, we do have um, a few rhinoplasty surgeons in the audience. I'll go ahead and share the results of poll number one. Um, about 20% of us do, I think 25% of us do rhinoplasties around half of our practices that much. The majority of the audience around 75% are doing rhinoplasties less than 25% of the time. <clears throat> um, and about 50% of our audience doesn't tend to do patients who are a little bit older, I would say. And in light of the fact that most of our patients who are in over 55 tend to have higher ASA classes, we were interested to know if people are changing their surgical setting in terms of making these patients in a hospital or inpatient versus in a surgical suite. And it appears that it's about 50, 50% primarily outpatient surgery. Um, we do have a question from Dr. Chandawarkar. If you want to turn on your microphone and ask, you're more than welcome to. Um, Akash? Sure, thank you. Um, my name is Akash Chandawarkar. I'm one of the uh, MEATH Aesthetic Fellows in New York with Dr. Albert and Dr. Aston, and uh, also a Next Generation Editor for ASJ. Um, thanks so much for the paper. Um, it was really interesting to see your results. Uh, we actually just had a short discussion about this during our Meath Journal Club today. Um, I was wondering if you had any issues with excess skin or mucosa in these uh, reductive rhinoplasties uh, that may not retract back as easily in older patients as the younger patient population and might result in any issues with hanging polymelas or super tip fullness. Um, and if those are any reasons that uh, patients have seek revisions. Thank you. Yeah, um, you know, I think in most cases we, uh, we haven't really seen that, especially with the structural graphing that's been used. Um, you know, one interesting thing um, leading off of what Dr. Nassif was saying about excising the medial crus and the intermediate crus in, in some of these cases, especially if we're deprojecting a little bit, if it's an over-rotated and over-projecting, we're trying to deproject and you get the medial crus flexing or, or closing off the uh, external valve a little bit, we've actually just been excising them and, and removing them and then placing the intermediate cruise onto the septal extension graft. But I haven't seen anything with the, the skin itself um, along the tip or the dorsum. 
Uh, and I think because we're uh, reattaching the medial crew swell to the septal extension graft, you know, nothing's happened with the chymella either. But uh, in some of these cases, yeah, we are definitely excising the medial curl feet. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, we also have a question from Dr. Paul Houdain. Um, I think primarily to Dr. Steinbacher and then open up to comments from the discussants as well. Paul? Hello. Hi, I'm a plastic surgery resident uh, last year from Guatemala. Uh, thank you for this journal collab. I would like to ask the first question is, I have heard several times from experts that we should be aware of, of early, elderly patients that come for aesthetic uh, primary rhinoplasty. I would like to hear your, your opinions on this and what strategy we could uh, use or take. Thank you. Oh, maybe you could clarify what what specifically would we be concerned about? Oh, uh, uh, because as as Dr. Steinberg said, the majority of patients uh, for primary aesthetic rhinoplasty they come in a younger age. So I have heard experts with a longer career saying that when someone elderly comes from an aesthetic primary rhinoplasty. Uh, we should, it's like kind of a red flag at that age because the change in the fascia is, is, uh, is very big and they don't, do not adapt to, to big changes. Uh, just wanted to, to know your opinion. Mark, Mark let me sp uh, speak to that. Please. Um, everybody can speak to it, but I see a reasonable number of older patients who have changes uh, that they would like to have made to their nose. And it's often, it, it, you know, first of all, in, Dr. Steinbach has, has said that while his, his patients came for uh, breathing problems or trauma, but 100% of them were interested in an aesthetic change. They were all concerned about the aesthetics of their nose. And, and while it's a, a small percentage of all the rhinoplasties, I do see older people who say, you know, I've, I've always wanted to do this. Am I too old to do it? Can you, can you make my a, a tip so it doesn't hang down? Or my tip has always been bulbous and it's one of those things that's bothered me all my, my life. Can we change that? And so I think obviously whether it's a you know, older person or a teenager, you have to evaluate in the psychological um, wellness of the patient. And I think that if when you carefully select the person, it's just with doing a, a facelift, you've got to select the patient who is understanding the limitations of patient that will um, be possible to um, make happy, make them understand to the extent you can, what you can achieve. There's no question about what a lot of older people who like would like not to have their nose hanging down. And we do a fair number of nasal uh, uh, plasties along with facelifts. So it's it's certainly reasonable. You know, there was a, there was a time that people said, watch out for males who are X number of years old and that sort of stuff. I, I think we've passed all of that now. I think it's evaluation of the patient 100% um, of the time, regardless of, of their age. Thank you, Dr. Asson. I wanted to, to Paul's point, if, if you don't mind, I want to read a, a quick quote from Tom Reese. He wrote an article called Rhinoplasty in the Older Adult. And I'm curious if Dr. Nassif and Dr. Steinbacher agree with this. He said, rhinoplasty in the older patient often fails to produce a result wholly satisfactory to the patient and the physician. And it's necessary to keep this in mind when selecting patients. So for other two speakers, do you agree? Do you, do you think it's harder to achieve a great result in an older patient? Are we talking about a subjective or objective aspect? What was Tom saying? Uh, he, he, he only said that it's, it's hard to produce a result wholly satisfactory to the patient and the physician. Okay, so both, both subjective and objective. Uh, my two cents on that, uh, 
from the patient standpoint, um, I feel at least assuming that every one of them have realistic expectations. And I agree with everything that Sherelle mentioned um, about, again, you have to evaluate the psychological standpoint of every patient. But to me, I feel that as the older patient comes in, I'm finding them to be more acceptable to imperfections. And to me, I feel like they're a lot happier with the results as compared to either a Simon individual. You all know what Simon is? Single, yeah. immature, male, obsessive, narcissistic. Okay. Versus some of the younger folks that come in that know everything about rhinoplasty. Uh, and two, uh, from the objective standpoint, from the nasal standpoint, at least for me, I actually don't agree with that. I, I feel that uh, even though the bones may be a little bit more brittle and osteotomy is a little bit more difficult, I, I, I don't see a difference. I actually like operating on the aging nose because you have that ptosis. And when you elevate and rotate and project the nose, I mean, it looks fantastic on the table. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, think, um, I think some of the, just, uh, you know, two seconds for, for that. I mean, there are several things that all these papers and our paper looked at that makes certain aspects more challenging, such as the really thin skin envelope and, you know, more weakness of the cartilage. But I think back in, in his time, they didn't have some of the same techniques or tools or graphs either, like a septal extension graft or like some of the blending techniques and adding crushed cartilage and, and fat. They weren't doing it as much. So... I think in some ways it is more challenging, but in other ways we have more tools and maneuvers at our disposal these days. Thank you so much. So uh, that's a nice uh, segue into our next two questions. Dr. Kenneth Francis, if you'd like to ask your question regarding the septal extension graft. I can go ahead and ask. Um, so Dr. Francis pointed out that Dr. Rorick has described the fixed mobile septal extension graft, which is both fixed and mobile, avoiding the complaints of a stiff nasal tip. Um, and he's interested in comments, Dr. Steinbacher. Yeah, I mean, I think that just has to do with the, leaving it in a pocket and maybe fixing it less, um, you know, with fewer sutures. But, you know, I think the advantage of a septal extension graft is uh, putting it and using it as a, a template for where to have the tip in the tip position be. So, you know, it, it, I think with all these things, we're balancing where is things going to be placed and corrected or overcorrected versus, you know, having some flexibility. So like I was saying before, my preference is to just not have the septal extension graft extend all the way to the tip, uh, but have it dictating the projection and uh, rotation to some extent, but actually lifting the domes up and above the septal extension graft. So you still get a sponginess to the tip, uh, but you get the reproducibility of using a septal extension graft. Mm -hmm. Dr. Nassif, I saw you shaking your head. No, I just was kind of thinking really, how do you do that? But I think it really depends on uh, the type of cartilage you have. I mean, uh, I think if you got septal cartilage and Maybe it's uh, not end to end, but side to side. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it may work. And of course, you know, Dr. Uh, Rorick has you know, been a pioneer in all these incredible papers and techniques. So uh, uh, I, I, I can't wait till I find a patient that says, hey, I like my septal extension graft. I'm still waiting for that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> another question about... <laughs> Uh, new techniques and um, instrumentation. Dr. Pierre Lepin, Le Pen, um, he's wondering if anyone uses piezo surgery for rhinoplasty. Um, I know typically it's for, we usually hear about it with uh, preservation. EP, yeah. <clears throat> um, I'll, I'll answer that first. So first of all, I just started in the last, uh, Dean Toriumi has been mentoring me uh, through a lot of thousands of phone calls. I'm driving him crazy on dorsal preservation surgery. So I'm just starting on that. So that's mm -hmm. an interesting thing. So I've now been doing a good amount of my primaries and it's a hard, hard surgery, but it's an interesting even though it's an older surgery. And uh, the piezo, I got mine about uh, three months ago. And um, you know, you can do osteotomies with it. It's a little bit hard. Taking down a hump is easy. You know, making a little hole if you want me, I enter nasal spine. So I have it. 
I like it, especially for taking down a hump um, because you really could control it. And again, it's an expensive instrument. And so if mm -hmm. the place you're gonna go has it, that's one thing. So that's my- uh, Dr. Nassif, uh, can, I, can I put you on the spot and ask why, why you're making the change? I mean, you've been getting great results for decades. Why, why do it? Oh, you mean the DP, dorsal preservation? Yeah. So I was in Turkey, um, of course I was with Turkey with all those guys that have been doing dorsal preservation a while ago and they were talking to me about it. And then Aaron Cousins, who, you know, trained with, you know, Rollin, uh, and um, was talking about it with Dean and then Dean started doing it. Then I went and saw Aaron do it. And I do have to say what I liked about it compared to someone who comes in, when you're doing a structural rhinoplasty and you're taking down a hump, more than two millimeters in my mind, you need spreader graphs. And for me to get those good aesthetic lines without getting an inverted V after a year, two years, three years, whatever it is, I started enjoying the concept of looking at not elevating the dorsal skin and not elevating the, you know, at, at all. I'm talking about maybe just going up just till you get past the W point uh, on the um, upper lateral cartilages. So when I saw these techniques being done and watching the aesthetic lines have taken that, uh, the septal strip, and there's many different ways to do it, and then doing these let down and push down procedures, it looked hard and it is hard. And when I saw it, I have to tell you, I liked it. Okay. So, and then now Dean, uh, who I respect as an incredible surgeon, uh, he did my nasal reconstruction, as a matter of fact, I've had four rhinoplasties and I've had um, Mo's reconstruction here with a huge composite graft to lower my nostril uh, from him all at the same time. So he's doing most of his, 90% of his primaries that way. And, and so to me, after looking and then talking to a bunch of guys in Europe, I just started doing it. You know, Now, most of my cases though, Mark, 75, 80% of what I do though is revision. Fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, 15th rhinoplasty with rib. And so when I do get that 25%, I'm gonna try it. And, and, and it's a whole different thing. But I do wanna share with you one thing just since, is I'm gonna share the screen. I wanna just show you guys one. Oh, can you, un, can you disable, I mean, can I screen share? Can you guys undo that for a second? I just wanna show two things to, these uh, lovely yeah. folks here. Oh, there we go. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm gonna show you two things real quick. So remember, can you see this for me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is someone who's about 60, the typical totic tip. And so here's especially, you gotta be careful when you take down hump when you're rotating the nose. I did have to take down some, but you usually need more augmentation. But that's very powerful. And this guy wanted a tip. He wanted about a, even though I over-rotated here, but it will drop down about 95 degrees. He didn't want a 90 degrees tip. So I had to do the whole thing. So here was that technique I was talking about where I'm fixating it up to really take care of the ptosis. And then the other one, I'll just show you real quick. Hold on one second. Give me one minute. I'm gonna just show you this last thing. We were talking about dice cartilage glue grafts. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. yep. so, we, so this was a dorsal augmentation that we made, you know, dice cartilage, that's your tissue and your dice cartilage. And then we make these little pancakes and you can use the pancakes anywhere. Uh, is, it, is it dome, infratip, columella, lateral nasal wall? So that's what I was saying. I like putting on the tip. And for example, I'll just show you one last thing. Uh, and that's, for example, right here, you can play with the size uh, of anything. This is more of a domal uh, a graft. Um, and so I just wanted to show that to you. Okay, thanks. That's really interesting. Um, and Dr. Steinbacher, Dr. Aston, did you want to weigh in on that? We do have another question. What do you think happens to the fibrin? Does that resorb at all? Or have you tried mixing it with fascia or fat? Um, and how do you suture that to the infralobular area? I don't suture, you don't have to, thank God. That's why you put a little bit of fibrin glue right after you put it on, you put a little fibrin glue and it sticks. 
and it hasn't moved. I've done, I don't know, you know, a mention of these, at least a couple hundred of them, and I haven't seen any movement yet at all so far. And then when you look at Tisheel, the fibrin glue, actually it helps with con uh, chondrocyte proliferation in the long term, and I'm sure it absorbs. And I used to do, Rollin got me doing DCFs, dice cartilage fascia grafts to all of you who don't know what that is. And I stopped doing that now about three years ago, just because the uh, variability and uh, shrink wrappage of the skin causing deformities of the DCF. So I now go solely to this. Uh, let's see, Dr. O'Dane, he has another question for us. Paul, did you want to ask another one? Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I've got uh, um, a simple question to Dr. Stenbaker. In, in the series presented, in the cohort presented, the dorsal augmentation was, uh, the percentage was quite high. Was it because of trauma, because, or was it because of a previous rhinoplasty that they had, they wanted uh, uh, to augment the dorsum? And what was the technique um, mostly common used? Thank you. Yeah, that, that's a good, quite astute question. Um, and um, yeah, like as we pointed out, it's a combination of trauma or over resected noses before, but it's a much higher percentage of dorsal augmentation than you know we see in in uh, my primary rhinoplasty practice, where most of the time it's uh, dorsal reduction. Um, and the you know the technique we used in some cases it was rib or some. Uh, you know, uh, septal autologous augmentation. And recently we've written up in the aesthetic journal too, using crushed cartilage and fat. So instead of mixing it with fibrin and instead of diced cartilage, we've used crushed cartilage from both the septum or lateral cruse and mixed it with fat and use that for augmentation as well. Right. Derek, table three says you, you fat grafted 89% of these patients. So that was all 89% was for dorsal augmentation? No, we, uh, we also wrote another paper where we inject fat along where we do the osteotomies because it seems to help with bruising and swelling. So most, most patients, we do that as well. Um, it wasn't always for augmentation. Um, you know, so some of the cases were for this injection and some of the cases were mixing it with crushed cartilage. Oh, great. I, I apologize for interrupting again. Uh, Dr. Stan, Stanberg, um, the fat grafting, just for my ignorance, is it what kind of fat, uh, millifat, microfat, or is it lobule fat, like uh, more, more big uh, pieces of fat? Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's usual, you know, sort of Coleman technique, not nano fat, but just regular sized, you know, with telfa straining, uh, usually from the abdomen. Dr. Steinbrecher, you, you, you found that that was helping with ecchymosis. You're putting it along the osteotomy sites. Is that right? What, what's the mechanism? Yeah, um, I'm not completely sure what the mechanism is, except for I think, you know, there's adipose stem cells and growth factors and placing it shortly after we've made the osteotomies. Uh, you know, I think it uh, serves in an anti-inflammatory way. Um, but you know that's one thing that we we started to see, and I, I think that that paper's in the aesthetic journal too, uh, maybe from a year ago. Well, we're getting close to nine o'clock. Are there any other questions or comments before we wrap it up from from anybody? I think we've covered the chat box. <clears throat> okay. Well, with that, I really want to thank Dr. Steinbacher, Dr. Aston, and Dr. Nassif for this really wonderful discussion tonight. Thank you to Phaedra Kress for all of her work in making tonight such a success. And we will see you all back here in November for the ASJ Next Gen Editors Journal Club that's hosted by Ryan Austin. And I'd like to thank you all for joining us and have a great night, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thanks again. Thanks for inviting me.